So let's talk about the first part of our discussion of the first of Holly's um, conditions under which we have a voluntary exchange. So there are a couple of wrong answers. Um, the first one is that is the suggestion that, well, look, in the business environment, there's no uh, constraint on what you can say. There's no requirement that you give any information. There's no requirement that you give any truthful information. So this is the view uh, articulated in a paper by this guy, Carr. Um, I'll talk about it in a second. I will not make you read the paper because, well, I won't. Uh, the second is the traditional medieval doctrine of caveat emptor, uh, generally speaking, let the buyer beware, which just basically shifts all the responsibility for finding out the information onto the buyer. So let's get to it. So Carr gives two arguments, as far as I can tell, um, in his discussion of why he thinks it is that uh, it's totally fine for people to lie and bluff and deceive in the business context. And the first one is something like a, uh, a self-defense argument. So the idea is this, when you go out in business, you, the scrupulous uh, business student, well, former business student, uh, looking to do the right thing and be a good person, uh, will run up against some shady characters. And there's sh shady characters in every walk of life, so no surprise, you're gonna find them in the business world too. And some of them are gonna deceive you and cheat and lie. And so Carr says, well, look, you know, because it's like a business is a competition, and in a lot of ways that's probably true, um, the fact that uh, other people are lying, you know, it's sort of doggy dog, so you need to stick up for yourself, and that means you need to lie back, and you need to lie, not lie back as in lie on your back, but lie in response to those who are pro who are trying to deceive you, and probably even preemptively. So that means that uh, the deception is supposed to be just part of how things happen and you have if you're going to play in that game well you need to do it too but that's not a very good argument from the moral point of view at least right because even if you know and this is something holly points out that even if you know that other people are doing really shady horrible things th that doesn't actually make it okay for you to do them too um and even if the way that one way that you can defend yourself against them doing horrible shady things is by being similarly shady that doesn't really make it true either this is the traditional principle you learned as a kid that two wrongs do not make a right it just makes two wrongs okay and the other thing to say about this is look even if it is true and it certainly is i mean in any area of life it is uh there are some people that are you know going to be deceptive try to rip you off try to lie um that doesn't make it a good thing. And even if it is, in fact, part of the business world, um, and in some industries it may more be, be more prevalent than others, um, it still is something that's really a, uh, it's a friction. It's a disutility. It's something that gets in the way of making deals, of making products, of doing all the things that one does in the business world. Um, the fact that you're constantly having to worry about being deceived is not like a good thing. Right. It's something that if we could improve the business, uh, the business environment, we would remove more of that because that would make it easier to do the sorts of things that business is good for. So the first thing to say is that, yeah, sure, even if it was true, uh, like Carr thinks that business, the business environment is competitive and people are going to lie and deceive you, that doesn't mean that you should do it, too. The second argument he gives is actually kind of interesting because he says, look, you know, there's some areas in life um, where things that are normally not okay are perfectly fine. So in the game of poker, for example, um, it is perfectly fine to lie and to bluff. If you get upset at somebody at the card table for, you know, uh, bluffing you about what they had in their hand, you are missing the point. I mean, it's the same thing as uh, in a judo competition. If somebody gets upset, you know, that you threw them on the ground, obviously within the rules, they are missing the point of what that game is, right? That's how you play judo. You throw each other on the ground. So the second argument that Carr gives is that, look, you know, there's something special about the business world. And once you enter into a business transaction, you're playing by different rules, different ethical rules, too. Uh, so it's like sitting down at the card table where, you know, lying and cheating is, is, is totally expected. But that doesn't really hold a lot of weight. I mean... Because 
most people expect to be dealt with honestly, or at least, you know, within reason, right? In most situations. And when you sit down to uh, buy a product or to contract for a service, most of the time you're not thinking, oh, now I'm playing this special game where it's totally fine to be lied to. And in fact, there's not, you know, a lot of evidence. I mean, the only evidence you're going to find that it's kind of totally fine is just by looking at how often it happens in an industry or an arena. But at the same time, there's plenty of things like the law and uh, corporate policies and all sorts of other things which point in the opposite direction, that this isn't a special domain where deception is okay, um, where it's allowed. I mean, it might be a special domain where it's common, but there's not much evidence that people think that, yeah, it's totally fine to lie to each other in these kind of contexts. And then once you realize that, and think about now what we're talking about in most of our uh, discussion over the knowledge condition, we're talking about uh, people buying uh, uh, consumers, oh, sorry, uh, buyers, but generally speaking, we're talking about consumers. So the fact that people are naive when they walk into the store um, and aren't expecting to suddenly be in a totally different world where it's okay to be lied to, that can't make it okay to lie to them, right? I mean, just the fact that they are, I mean, that that's sort of the, the wolf's, uh, you know, look, there's sheep around, so I'm going to eat them. What's wrong with that? Well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that when we're talking about wolves catching literal sheep, but the fact that you can rip off somebody doesn't make it okay to rip them off. I don't know why anybody would actually think that. But let's move on. So those are the two arguments that Carr gave to try to establish this thesis, which, by the way, in the paper, it's not clear that he actually holds the top line view here, what he actually seems to be saying. But anyways, he tries to say that it's justified uh, to engage in deception through something like self-defense, and it's justified uh, because it's like a business is a special arena, and neither of those seem to be uh, very persuasive whatsoever. So the second thing, the second bad um, knowledge condition answer would be uh, the principle of caveat emptor on its own. And the principle of caveat emptor is basically, uh, well, it's, you know, the idea that the everything is on the buyer. So the buyer beware, right? Um, and the thought is that if you have enough opportunity to do your due diligence, check out the product, look at it, inspect it, make sure it meets your specifications, then, you know, uh, the that's all there is to the sale, to what knowledge you need to have. And this was a medieval ju judicial principle. Um, and for a lot of reasons, it probably made sense in that context. But, and, it, and to be sure, it does exist in some particular arenas in uh, at least U.S. consumer law and other countries' consumer law. I mean, if you ever see something being sold, you know, sort of as is, that's uh, basically saying we are relying on this principle of caveat emptor. Um, but the, basically idea, or the basic idea of caveat emptor is, again, that it is entirely on the buyer to... Uh, assess the quality of the product. And a lot of times that means that um, there's no, or it's been taken to mean that the seller uh, is totally off the hook for any kind of deception, right? Now, Holly says that this is not very good uh, principle uh, and for good reasons, right? Um, if you're buying a car, if you're buying a used car, do you have the ability on your own to assess, you know, its quality? Uh, some of you might, but probably most of us don't. Uh, that's why you probably take it to a, a mechanic. And you can just imagine the problems across all sorts of product areas where it's really just in principle too complex for a buyer to be able to take a look at the product and decide whether it's of the quality and, you know, of the kind that they need. So that means that the buyer is going to need to rely on the seller to give them accurate information about the product. Again, if we uh, were relying just on caveat emptor, well, um, Amazon is probably going to go out of business, right? Because at, you know, so our best case scenario, things that are sold online are going to have to be discounted a huge amount so that it's, you know, in people's interest and it's worthwhile to take the risk that the thing you get is, the prob is not going to be the thing that you want. And more generally, 
any time, you know, we're going to have, uh, you know, the assessing the quality of a product is going to require the, the buyer to spend a lot of time or money or other resources. Um, we're just adding a huge amount of friction and a huge amount of inefficiency to the system. And again, remember that our overall principle is to make sure that there can be acceptable exchanges. And that, in Holly's mind, means putting some of the burden over onto the seller. The seller is going to have to give certain kinds of information uh, and be sort of upfront about it so that the buyer can rely on them. So this was two, uh, two bad theories of the knowledge condition. One where it says basically, eh, it, there's no obligation to be honest. And the second, which is, well, you know, it's all on the buyer as long as the buyer has the opportunity to inspect. Uh, we'll turn next to the uh, actual thing that Holly thinks about the knowledge condition.